Hello, welcome everyone to uh, to Pulse today. Our speaker is going to be Peter Wojtykowski from University of Denver, and he'll talk about uh, solvability and supernova potents in algebras that are close to groups. Please. Yes, thank you, Peter, for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here and give a talk on this topic. Uh, let me share the screen with you. I hope it works well. Here we go. So I'll leave the camera on, but I'll mostly stare at the screen. So if you have some questions, uh, maybe just start talking. It's hard to keep track of uh, people raising hands online. Anyway, so this is uh, um, this is uh, the topic: solvability and supernova potents in varieties close to groups and. It's a joint work with uh, Alex Drapal and David Stanowski, both uh, from Charles University in Prague. Probably most of you know David Stanowski because uh, he works quite a bit in universal algebra. Alex Drapal uh, does mostly group theory and non-associative mathematics. Um, so here we go. Okay, so the outline will periodically pop up always with the name of the next chapter and we start with what I call the classical solvability and congruent solvability because as you will see I need to make a distinction between those two in the varieties that I care about. But let's start with what will lead to the congruent solvability. So this is by now a well-known of course an established theory of Fries and McKenzie from 1978 uh, that starts with the commutator theory for congruence modular varieties and the basic definition there is uh, whether one congruence centralizes another over yet another congruence, so alpha centralizes beta over delta, and this is expressed in uh, as a term condition, and it's a little bit hard to, to read it if you have not seen it, although I suspect most of people here in this audience have seen it. Uh, so what it says is, uh, if you have any term, if you have some congruence is alpha, beta, beta, and delta, if the UV terms or UV arguments are beta related, uh, then you can replace the X arguments with alpha related uh, Y arguments, right? So that's what it says. And, uh, and of course, this is going to be uh, easy to satisfy if delta, delta is everything, because if delta is everything, then the conclusion of the implication holds, and therefore the entire implication holds, and it becomes hard when delta is, is small. So the definition of the commutator uh, of congruences, which we will denote in the usual way for commutator, uh, is the smallest congruence delta such that alpha centralizes beta over delta. And it is, uh, yes, 1988. OK, I apologize for, for that. Uh, so it's not even clear from the definition that uh, the commutator is, for example, symmetric with respect to alpha and beta, right? But it happens to be uh, the case. Uh, so a little bit more, I would just like to quickly get to the notion of congruent solvability. So these are the smallest and the largest congruence on some algebra A, the diagonal and the full uh, square congruence. And uh, we'll say that an algebra is solvable if this derived series, I put it in quotation marks, but um, mostly for emphasis, is good, and should be called the derived series, reaches zero in finitely many steps, right? And you start at uh, the full congruence and you iterate the commutator. And if you reach a zero in finitely many steps, let's call the algebra solvable. Later on, when I need to make the distinction, when I speak of congruent solvability, then this is uh, what, I, what I mean. And uh, the algebras we'll mostly work with are generalizations of groups, and those who know me they probably suspect that this had to come up. Uh, so a loop is an algebra uh, with three binary and one unary operation, or one uh, the nullary operation, and uh, it's supposed to mimic groups. Uh, so you can think of the dot as a multiplication, and uh, of the slashes as the left and right division. And for example, the middle line says, that if you first uh, divide by x on the left and then multiply by x on the left, then that has no effect, right? So the, indeed, the division is inverse to the 
multiplication and similarly on the right and there is an identity element as in groups one now uh, what does this say in terms of translations is if lx is the usual left translation as in groups and rx the right one then this means that uh, all the translations have to be bijections of uh, the underlying set okay and uh, you can therefore form a permutation group out of them let's call it a multiplication group it's going to be the group uh, that is generated by all the permutations that correspond to left and right translations uh, in the finite case just to visualize what's going on with, with these so-called groups uh, the multiplication table of a loop is a normalized Latin square, right? So the fact that the translations are bijections means that in every row and in every column, every symbol occurs exactly once. That's the Latin square property and normalized just says there's an identity element. The first row and first column read one up to n if you order the elements that way. But unlike in groups, uh, there need not be two-sided inverses, for example, among other properties, and uh, associativity does not necessarily help. And the lack of associativity makes calculations and argument and proofs uh, you know, much more complicated, uh, and you will see some of this coming up a bit, but uh, you can think informally of loops as non-associative groups or not necessarily associative groups, uh, because they share many properties with groups. Now, uh, what is the relation between congruences and normal subalgebras? Well, it's as in group theory, fortunately. Uh, so if you want to go from a congruence to a normal subloop, you just take the congruence class containing the identity element. And if you want to go the other way around, if you have a normal subloop, then you can uh, consider the coset with respect to this normal subloop that will partition the algebra, and this will be, of course, the congruence classes of the resulting equivalence relation. Now, like in groups, we have uh, conjugation. So the first we have the T sub A, which is the traditional notation in this part of mathematics, is a conjugation by A. Uh, you multiply on the left and you divide on the right by A. And the other two types of mappings uh, measure deviations from associativity once when you multiply on the left, uh, that's the LABs, and once when you multiply on the right, that's the RABs. And these are the so-called inner mappings, like we have inner automorphisms in groups. They are not necessarily automorphisms anymore, uh, but inner mappings, and they generate a subgroup of the multiplication group called the inner mapping group. And now I have enough to state sort of the main result here, not of the talk, but for the introduction, uh, which is a description of the commutator of two congruences when it is specialized to the variety of loops. I did not prove that that uh, loops form a congruence model variety. I will mention later that in fact they form a congruence permutable variety, uh, but certainly we are in the setting of the general theory. Uh, but it turns out that the only terms that you need to consider to generate uh, the commutator are these three special types of terms. Uh, one from uh, the conjugations and the two from the deviations from associativity. So just it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but what is happening here is that the subscripts that denote the terms are beta related and uh, the argument is uh, alpha related to one, to the identity element. So it's in the equivalence class of alpha containing one. And so if you close this uh, generating set as a congruence, you obtain exactly uh, the commutator of alpha and beta. So it's a relatively uh, simple description of the commutator. Of course, it's much more complicated than in groups, but still not too bad. There is only a few terms you have to keep track of. And a few more terms uh, before we can, uh, or concepts before we can continue. So we'll call an algebra abelian if uh, the full congruence is uh, has a trivial commutator and again fortunately abelian loops so the abelian objects in the variety of loops are precisely abelian groups so there are no exotic abelian structures in loop theory they are just abelian groups now if you take so now i come to the, the, the one of the main points of the talk which is there's two kinds of solvability that uh, compete 
uh, for space in loop theory. And the classical solvability is uh, from group theory. Right? So of course, in group theory, we have a notion of solvability. And one of the ways in which you can express that a group is solvable is to say that you have a subnormal series. In this case, I can assume with our sort of generality that all the QIs are in fact normal in the, in the full loop Q, where each factor is an abelian group, right? So this is, of course, the classical definition of solvability from groups. So you have a finite subnormal series with abelian factors. And now for the other concept, I, will now, I would now like to express congruent solvability slightly differently than we did so far in an equivalent way. Let's have a name for the situation that when you take a, a normal subgroup and you take its commutator, I've done the commutator for congruences, but of course there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between congruences and normal substructures. So this is the congruences induced by X if you wish. If you calculate the commutator in the full algebra Q, and if it's trivial, one meaning zero congruence here, it's, the, <laughs> it's slightly confusing, but in terms of subloops, of course, it makes sense to write one here for the trivial subloop. Uh, then, uh, if this is the case, we say that the subloop induces an abelian congruence. So this is a phrase I will use because I need to speak of this situation frequently. So I could be saying X as a trivial commutator or something like that. We'll be saying induces an abelian congruence. And then you can restate congruent solvability in an equivalent way so that it resembles the definition I just gave for classical solvability. You have some kind of a uh, subnormal series. Again, I will actually need this time that all these QIs are normal in Q, such that every factor now induces an abelian congruence of Q modulo QI. So QI plus one modulo QI induces an abelian congruence in the large factor. And it's now clear uh, when you think about it for just a little bit that congruent solvability implies classical solvability. It's a stronger condition to induce an abelian congruence than just being an abelian group. Okay, so congruent solvability always implies classical solvability in this setup, uh, but uh, I went backwards. Okay, sorry. Uh, the question is uh, when they coincide, these two theories. So that's the first general open problem in which varieties of loops or other varieties close to groups do the theories coincide, and uh, in which varieties of loops does every abelian normal subgroup? induce an abelian congruence. So let me just comment briefly, which is what I think have in the next bullet point, that should the second property be true in your variety, that every normal subgroup induces an abelian congruence, every abelian normal subgroup, then of course the two theories coincide because there's no difference in the two definitions I have just displayed, right? The moment you have an abelian substructure, it will induce an abelian congruence. Uh, so if the second is true, the first is true as well. Uh, but it can certainly be true that you have some solvable structures or the two theories could coincide without the second property holding. Okay? It can somehow happen that there are some bad abelian substructures that do not induce the abelian congruence, but in every case there is some other path uh, from the bottom to the top uh, some other subnormal series that does not have this defect. So that is, uh, in a nutshell, the, the problem here, whether you can, uh, if you can prove the second property, then of course the theories coincide, uh, but it might be possible they coincide for other reasons, more subtle reasons. So, indeed, the two solubilities are strictly different. There are small examples of loops of order eight that are classically solvable, but not congruent solvable. So the, th the theory is definitely different. And this little example, or just a description of an example, is supposed to tell you that you can get pretty close to groups and still maintain the distinction between these theories. So a ball loop, I uh, can forget immediately because I will not use it again, but it happens to be a variety of loops satisfying this axiom here. And uh, these are fairly close to groups, yet there is a counterexample you know, showing that the two solvability theories are not the same. You know, a little bit bigger, but still quite small. So let's uh, start investigating this question. 
a little bit talk about abelian extensions. So I would like to describe congruent solvable algebras in yet different way, and I'll stick to loops. And they will essentially be iterated abelian extensions. So I need to describe the one step. What is an abelian extension? Uh, well, so if you have an x and a abelian group and x some loop on, on the direct product, you twist the second coordinate by some automorphisms, phi and psi, and you add something that we should think of as a co-cycle. And they have to satisfy no condition whatsoever except the normalizing condition. All that the last line says is that, you know, for the identity element, these automorphisms are trivial in a certain way, and the co-cycle uh, is trivial when one of the arguments is the identity. Uh, it's not hard to prove uh, that uh, x induces an abelian congruence if and only if it's an abelian extension of x by the factor. And that a loop is congruent solvable if and only an, if it's an iterated abelian extension. Uh, so let me show you a picture of this abelian extension, just visualizing uh, what the previous slide said. So you can imagine the direct product organized according to the cosets of x. Right? And in every square, you have to twist the rows or the columns or permute them according to some automorphism. And this is the generic square in the middle here where you, um, you know, apply permutations to rows and columns and add a co-cycle. Now, in the boundary cells, the co-cycle disappears. And in the very corner, uh, everything disappears. And it's just a copy. You see the copy of X sitting in the top left corner. Uh, in exactly its canonical form. So this is how abelian extensions look like visualized. And, and you might wonder, well, this seems like a relatively strong uh, condition to have a table that can be so organized. Uh, yet uh, in uh, groups, for example, the two theories coincide of uh, congruent solvability and classical solvability. Uh, but the proof is very easy for it. Once you know that all you have to do is to show that every x, let us say, uh, which is an abelian normal subgroup, induces an abelian congruence. That's all we need to prove for groups. And the proof is this one line, uh, uh, which is still not on the screen, but will be in a second. So let us first write the abelian extension in an internal version, just like you have external and internal direct product. This is the internal version of it. So x is a uh, abelian normal subgroup. And you have some left transversal, u, and you just multiply two elements, r is from the transversal, x is from the subgroup, and so forth. And you want the outcome to be, again, something from the transversal times something from x. So this is just the same formula you saw before written internally. And uh, here is the proof that's truly one line. Let's, let's go to it really quickly. So if I do rx times sy, I will introduce some conjugation by s, which uh, well, I inserted s, s to minus 1. And I have inserted u, r, s, and u, r, x to minus 1. And then uh, this uh, everything, the last three factors, the y, the s to minus 1, x, s, and the u, r, s to minus 1, r, s, are all elements of x. It's clear for the y and the conjugation from normality. For this other element, it's clear from the fact that they are in the same concept of u, so sorry, same concept of x. So therefore, of course, uh, uh, u to minus one r x is going to be in x. And because it's an abelian group, I can move it to the end. And I exactly have the form now where uh, I obtain, uh, I apply one automorphism, in fact, the conjugation here by s. Turns out that I need no automorphism, or there's just the identity for the second slot. And in the third one, the co-cycle is just this particular expression. Okay. So that's the proof for groups. <laughs> and uh, now, uh, about half of my talk is dedicated to the difficulty we are having in trying to generalize this one-line calculation to a more general setting. So the power of associativity is tremendous, and you can quickly uh, show that the two theories coincide in groups. Now, there is some vestiges of associativity in loop theory, and that's when you are dealing with uh, so-called nuclei. And the nucleus, so on the top line, there is the left nucleus, that set of all elements that associate with any other two elements when that element x in question 
is in the left slot of the associative law. And similarly for the middle and right nucleus, and the intersection of all three is the so-called nucleus. Uh, I'm sorry, I want to go back. Uh, and the lemma we, just, we have just seen for groups uh, can be modified relatively easily to go through as long as your normal abelian subgroup uh, is contained in the, let's say, middle and right nucleus. Okay, so then it turns out that all the calculations we have done will go through with a slight modification, no problem. So as long as you are living inside a nucleus or even a little bit weaker in just the intersection of these two nuclei, then it will induce an abelian congruence. Uh, well, the variety of loops I'll mostly be focusing on are so-called MUFANG loops. Uh, so these are loops that satisfy this particular identity. It's very similar to the left ball identity. The only difference is that the parenthesizing is x, y, x on the right is the other way around. It gets confused all the time and there is lots of papers in which the identities are confused and so are the results, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, this might be a variety that you have heard about before, even if you don't work in an associative algebra, because maybe you have heard of octonians. Right? And, and octonians, uh, as a generalization of quaternions, is a, that's a non-associated algebra uh, whose elements of, let's say, norm 1, or, or at least non-zero norm, uh, satisfy this law. They form a MUFANG loop. And these are very close to group indeed. For example, they have this diassociative property, meaning that any two elements generate a subgroup. Okay, so if you look at an expression involving only x and y's, their inverses, and so forth, then you get a group. This also proves that inverses will exist, right? Because you can take the group generated by x and it's going to be a cyclic group, so it's going to be x to minus one for free. All four nuclei coincide in MUFAN groups, uh, so you don't need to take the intersection. And the smallest non-group example is of order 12, and there is some standard doubling procedure, essentially like the Cayley Dixon doubling procedure, uh, that if you start with uh, the symmetric group of order 6 on three letters, uh, you get a non-group example. Well, no, but the bad news, which of course is good news because we have something to do, is that abelian normal subgroups of a MUFAN group need not induce an abelian congruence. So the strategy that worked for groups, that uh, everything works beautifully, does not work for MUFAN groups, and in general we'll have to be more careful about this. Uh, the next two slides present the example. I will not go into much details, but basically what's happening is that uh, you start with uh, the two element field, and you have a elementary abelian 2 group, which is a vector space, and you have some quadratic form. And anytime you have a quadratic form, you have the associated bilinear form, right? Uh, so that's, I didn't put it on the slide, but h of uv is q of u plus v minus q u minus q v. So that's the associated bilinear form from the theory of vector spaces with forms. And then on the direct product, you can define some multiplication, here it is, it's not important for the purposes of the talk what it is. And it turns out that this construction produces a loop that is congruent solvable always, therefore it's classically solvable. In fact, we'll see later once I define the concept that it's nilpotent. It's a Mufang loop. And uh, it's a group if and only if the quadratic form is linear. So if the associated bilinear form is, uh, vanishes, then you get a group. If it doesn't vanish, you get a non-associative example. It is an abelian normal subloop, namely zero times the vector space W. And uh, any time it's not a group, then always this uh, X is not going to induce an abelian congruence. So it's actually very easy. I mean, it took us a while to find this example, but, but uh, now when we have this example, it's easy to construct examples of MUFANG loops with a normal abelian subloop that does not induce an abelian congruence. So that does not mean, as this example illustrates, that the whole algebra is not congruent solvable in this fact. It, it is, right? It's just that there exists a different path of witnessing solvability. It cannot go uh, through this normal abelian subloop X. So this X here has just index 2 in Q? Uh, 
X is of index two, correct? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the basic construction, it's just of index two. Yes. Okay. So uh, just a few more facts about MUFAN groups. I would like to give you just a little bit of flavor of what is being done. I will not go into details, but uh, so we have talked about inner mappings, which are the things that measure uh, deviations from associativity. And every inner mapping in a MUFAN group happens to be so-called pseudo-automorphism, which is a terrible name, but uh, established in the theory. And it is like an automorphism, except that there is a C, we call the companion, that uh, violates uh, the fact that it's a homomorphism slightly. Okay. These, by the way, are results of graphs with our classical results from the fifties, I think. Uh, every pseudo-automorphism is then a semi or semi-automorphism, and semi-automorphism is uh, this strange property that you are applied the homomorphic property, but only for expressions of the form x, y, x. Okay, and you also have to fix one for technical reasons. And it turns out that any semi-automorphism behaves well with respect to powers, so that's good. And here's a quick proof that shows that. If we have a two divisible abelian group, then every semi automorphism of X is in fact an automorphism. So, this is a general fact that's nothing to do with Mufan groups. If you have a semi automorphism of a two divisible abelian group, that's an automorphism. And the proof is here, uh, it's on one line that the only interesting here I'm using the two divisibility, X is expressed as u squared, uh, then you shuffle into commutativity. That is exactly set up to apply the semi-automorphic property you collect and so forth. You see the line in front of you. But this gives us a strategy for a MUFAN group with a normal subgroup that is a two-divisible abelian group. Because on that two-divisible abelian group, uh, I can consider an inner mapping. There will be a pseudo-automorphism. There will be a semi-automorphism. And therefore, it's going to be an automorphism. Okay. So in this... Uh, task that we have to, to produce abelian extensions when we need automorphisms, we now have some foothold for it. And uh, uh, here is a corollary that just says what I said a minute ago, that uh, every inner mapping of a MUFAN group restricts to an automorphism of X, as long as X is two divisible abelian normal subloop. And uh, there are some other results before I get to uh, Mimicking the calculation for groups a little bit. Uh, this one, I think I don't even have to mention, but the, the next one I would like to spend a second on. This is a, sort of a fundamental identity in MUFAN groups, uh, which seems very complicated, but really when this was discovered by Gabula, it opened up lots of lines of research. And uh, the prime three appears in this identity. There are some third powers. And uh, it is fair to say that in MUFAN groups, nearly everything interesting happens for the prime p equal to 3. Uh, p equal to 2 some might, might behave differently, but p equal to 3 is really different from all the other primes in the theory of MUFAN groups. So it's not so surprising that it's here. But this is true in any MUFAN group, this very strange identity that allows you to take u to third power, another u to third power, and multiply, and there's some price to pay for that. Uh, but it says that if you start with a loop that it's three divisible, meaning every element is a cubed power of something, then this is in fact a formula for multiplying elements because any element can be expressed as cube of somebody. Okay, and uh, yes. So uh, I already forgot the. The identity defining move on loops, but yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, u to the three i, how how is the, uh, does it matter? It does not matter because it's dissociative, mm. right? So so in a, in a, in anything that's generated by one or two elements behaves as a group. So the powers are well defined as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good question. And, and uh, uh, then u to the u to three mm. i x mm -hmm. is uh, this is. Computed first. Yeah. If you omit the dot, then yes, I'm sorry. There, about it. Yes. So I, I should have put parentheses around the u to three i x. Uh -huh. uh, we of course don't to save space and yeah. improve legibility, but that's what it means. Uh -huh. First, multiply u to three i x, then multiply by u to three j y. Answer. Okay. So now 
I will show that in the six divisible and three divisible cases, uh, we have the same properties for groups, namely that the two properties coincide. And uh, just briefly, I will not, of course, go through this calculation, but the point is, if your abelian normal subgroup is too divisible, you can more or less do what you do in groups. Uh, you just have to manipulate the expressions much more. Uh, but it turns out that at every step you need to do the manipulation, uh, something comes out, such as in this case the conjugation. In this case, in the second one, there is some f, which is some product of left translations. And all of these happen to be inner mappings, and therefore they act as automorphisms on x. Okay, And uh, you can then uh, rewrite the expression by a series of steps. This is only about one third of the calculation. But I wanted to get at least to the critical point that one has to employ the three divisibility, otherwise you would be stuck at that point. Uh, the outcome is you can rewrite the expression for these transversals as we have seen before, uh, and see that such an x induces an abelian congruence. But what we need is three divisibility and also x to be two divisible. So the conclusion is if x is two divisible, then uh, it induces an abelian congruence in a three divisible Buffon group. And as a corollary, if it is both two and three divisible, meaning six divisible, then in fact the two theories coincide. Whether the loop is finite or infinite, the congruent solvability and uh, classical solvability are the same. Okay. Now, uh, I'll say just a very few words about three divisible case, and it's also true. So here's a general characterization of when x induces an abelian congruence, and it turns out all has to be satisfied with this uh, strange identity. And if you look at it, uh, u is from the end big loop and xy is from the subgroup, it sort of suggests that uh, something has to commute. If u is equal to 1, then you see that x is to be commutative, right? Uh, it's also sort of an instance of an associative law but not for all elements, all triples from Q, but two of them have to be from the normal subloop. So it's a weak version of associativity. And uh, after much work and using some theorems of Alex Trapal about multiplication groups that I stay here but don't want to comment on, one can prove by means that are very different from the one we have seen so far that uh, the result is also true for three divisible, finite in this case, three divisible Mufan groups. Uh, so it's no more true here, because we have had counter examples in, uh, in groups of order two to the k, you remember the vector space example I gave, showed that the, the strategy of working with a uh, abelian normal subgroup x is doomed to fail. So there, there's some other means to prove that, uh, but uh, we managed to do that as well. Uh, now, let me say a few words on a related topic that came out of this uh, nearly for free, and it's the so-called odd order theorem for Mufan groups. So of course, you know the odd order theorem for groups, uh, which is the five Thompson theorem. Every group of uh, odd order is solvable, right? And Glauberman, uh, George Glauberman proved, it's one of his seminal papers, that every Mufan group of odd order is classically solvable. Uh, he didn't say classically, but classically solvable in our language. Glauberman is a group theorist, and he only was working with Mufan groups because he needed to establish some rather deep theorems for the classification of finite simple groups, strangely enough. Uh, but this result uh, appears in the paper. So he has odd order theorem for Mufan groups in terms of classical solvability. But uh, now when we don't know whether the theories are the same or whether congruent solvability is stronger, uh, we would like to prove the stronger version of the order theorem. And we can do that. And the result that we use is a very recent, very difficult result of Piroshka Cherget. I think it now appeared in Journal of Algebra, about 40 pages, uh, that every non trivial Mufan group of odd order has a non trivial nuclear. And I don't, I cannot even summarize the proof, but I just want to say that there is a basic setup by which you can turn every problem about group theory into a group theory problem. But the, uh, the difficulty is that the group theory problems typically you don't know how to solve and nobody does. But I would like to at least make you aware of this transition. And uh, it goes as follows. 
So collect all the left translations, let's call it LQ, and collect all the right translations. Or, and these are transversals, so the inner mapping group is a subgroup of the multiplication group, and both LQ and RQ happen to be transversals to it, right? So a selection of one element from every poset. In fact, they are transverses to every conjugate of the inner mapping group. So this in group theory is sometimes called a stable transversal. It's not just transversal to a subgroup, but to every conjugate of that subgroup at the same time. That's the case here. Moreover, if you take the commutator, the classical group theory commutator of the two sets, uh, you get something that are inner mappings, so containing inner mappings. And the last condition, the yeah, group theory is this is the core of uh, of uh, I think it should be the other way around. Uh, it should say core of NQ in MLTQ. I apologize. It's a, those two should be interchanged. It's a typo. What is trivial, what it says is that if you are looking for a normal subgroup of MLTQ in NQ, the only one you find is, is the trivial subgroup. So the core is the largest normal subgroup contained, right, of the whole group contained in the given subgroup. And Abstractly, if you have this setup, you have two stable transversals uh, whose commutator is in the subgroup, such that the subgroup is core free, a trivial core in the big group. You can always build a loop out of this and vice versa. So, this is a universal representation theorem for all loops, completely in the language of groups, cosets, and subgroups. Uh, but the difficulty is that it's hard to work with. With cosets and transversals in group theory. Nevertheless, that's her basic setup. Yes. So, from these uh, 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 groups, mm -hmm. and group elements, you, if you know them uh, abstractly, you can get an isomorphic copy of your loop. Exactly, that. yes, you can. So, you build an isomorphic copy. And if you look at papers, of which there are quite a few of Piroshka Chirge, they all are just group theory papers. Let's start with translating the problem to group theory, and then it, then she goes. Okay, in this case for forty pages, and uh, and uh, but nevertheless uh, we can use this uh, her result and prove quite easily that every Mufan group of odd order is indeed congruent solvable. So the stronger condition, and uh, uh, you go by means of smallest country example. If uh, you have a non-trivial nucleus, which we have, we have so. The nucleus cannot be everything. If it's everything, then we are done by phi Thompson theorem because it's a group. So that's going to be congruent solvable. Otherwise, you use just really elementary group theory, nothing difficult. And, uh, and you end up with that this particular X that you construct, which is some subgroup of the nucleus, is going to uh, induce an abelian congruence. Okay? And once it induces an abelian congruence, you know that your NRQ by induction is an iterated abelian extension, and, and you finish by induction on the order. So we are quite happy to, to get this uh, strengthened uh, odd order theorem for Mufan loops. Uh, but in fact, very recently, and this is not yet published and not yet really written, but I'm convinced it's correct, we can prove that in the finite case for Mufan loops, the two theories coincide as well. Okay. So, yes, it was proven in the six divisible and the finite three divisible case, but it's actually true in the finite case. In the infinite case, we don't know, and there might be a counterexample. It's hard to tell. But uh, the methods here are, again, quite a bit different. And one of the key ingredients that I wish to mention, because maybe some of you are interested in these topics, are so called groups with triality. And a, and a group with triality uh, is just a group that admits certain automorphisms that generate uh, the symmetric group S3 and satisfy the so-called triality condition. Uh, these show up in, in uh, for example, uh, Lee theory when, uh, or in any situation when you have the D4 Dinkin diagram. And, uh, it turns out that, in general, in MUFAN groups, uh, you might not be able to build group neutrality in an easy way out of it. But if the nucleus is trivial, then you can. So anytime you have a trivial nucleus, you can consider the multiplication group, which is generated by all the translations, 
And there are certain automorphisms. Here, the sigma sends the left translation to the inverse of the right and the right to the inverse of the left. And it extends uniquely to an automorphism and so forth. If you are interested in this topic, which is fascinating and, and quite deep, then I recommend seeing a recent uh, volume of the memoirs of AMS by Jonathan Hall. Uh, I think the title is something like Mufang groups and groups with triality are essentially the same thing. I think that's the name of, of the memoirs. Okay. So there's lots of information on this particular topic. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I would like to talk about uh, nilpotence and supernilpotence. Uh, Peter, where am I supposed to stop? So I went for about half an hour so far. Uh, no, for 40 minutes, right? 40 minutes, yes. So I have Still 10. 10 more. I will manage. Okay, so nilpotence. So f just like you can from the general theory define solvability using a, uh, a derived series, you can define the lower center series. Uh, you just iterate the construction by taking the commutator of the congruence with the full uh, congruence and an algebra is nilpotent if you reach zero in finitely many steps. There is a notion of a center that universal algebra is no well. It's the largest congruence that centralizes the biggest congruence over the smallest one. And fortunately, in roots, these concepts agree with what you would like to. The nilpotence that you can transfer from group theory is the same as this universal algebraic nilpotence. The center is what you would more or less expect. So these are the elements that associate with everything and also commute with everything, right? So it's a straightforward generalization of a center of a group. Then you have the notion of an upper center series by factoring by the center iteratively and so on. But even simple questions about nilpotence can be very difficult. And I've decided just to show one example here. Uh, this is uh, really a topic that one of my colleagues has spent a lot of time on. And I will spend maybe just a minute or two today. This is a theorem that everybody from undergraduate group theory knows, namely the group model of the center is isomorphic to the inner automorphism group. So one way to sort of read it is that the group has a nilpotent class at most two, if and only if the inner automorphism group is abelian, right? That's one way to, to read this as a consequence of this result. Now, <clears throat> we have the notion of, uh, as I said, nilpotence is exactly the same as in groups. So we have the notion of nilpotence class. So Bragg proved if the class is at most two, then the inner mapping group is abelian. But the converse is an insane problem. If you have an in Q abelian, does it follow that the loop is of class at most two? Now, it turns out no. Uh, Piroshka Cherge that I already mentioned constructed a country example, rather large, of something where the inner mappings commute, uh, but the nilpotence class is three. So immediately people started asking, can the class be four, uh, and so forth. We are mathematicians, right? So we uh, seek problems like that. Uh, Gabor Not and myself constructed a MUFAN group with the same property. And here is the punchline. So after approximately 10 years of effort and using automated deduction on a massive scale, Michael Kenyon and Bob Verhoff proved that this simple problem, in fact, uh, has a solution in loop theory. Then, namely, if the inner automorphisms commute, then the loop can be of nilpotence class no higher than three. It's really hard to describe what kind of effort this was. Uh, the, the computers were running for the 10 years with lots and lots of uh, various approaches. Some of the proofs produced are among the longest obtained by automated deduction. And we know that because we go to the automated deduction conferences and talk to talk to the experts. They can have up to 100,000 deductive steps. So it's not like in 20 steps the proof finishes. It's hundred thousands of steps before you get to the result. Uh, moreover, I'm chilling a little bit in the sense that uh, some human intervention was needed at some point the computers got stuck could not move any further and michael kenyon had to use his own computer meaning his brain to to finish the last step and i think the proof the computers couldn't quite do the last step it was quite abstract conceptual and the machines are terrible at such things but on the other hand without what the computers proved michael's conceptual ideas would not get the result he very much needed uh, the, the, the details uh, and some partial elements. 
Okay, so this has been solved, but for example, it's still open if you can have a group that inner mapping group is a BDM class is three and the group be commutative. We don't know. That's only for arbitrary Q or arbitrary Q. Uh, arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Arbitrary. Uh, so now, finally, to the last topic of supernal potence. So, uh, what is a supernal potence? Well, let's start with the most important result about finite nilpotent groups, and that's, of course, the decomposition theorem. It's a direct product of its slow P subgroups, right? So you can write a finite nilpotent group, or it's nilpotent if and only if it's a direct product of P groups is a consequence. And it turns out that... Uh, Nilpotence as a concept from universal algebra is too weak to give you the analog of this theorem more generally. Uh, but uh, Erhard Eichinger, I'm sorry, I misspelled your name, Erhard, and I did it consistently throughout the talk. I see it now, so my apologies for that. Uh, so, so Erhard Eichinger and, and Mudrinsky identified a concept stronger than nilpotence and uh, it's called super nilpotence, and that precisely guarantees the decomposition theorem in reasonable varieties, namely in varieties that are congruence permutable. So if you have congruence permutable variety, the congruence is permute in this sense that if you compose them, the result is the same. Of course, that is equivalent by Maltzev's result of having a Maltzev term. And in groups, this is a Maltzev term, but in loops, you don't have to search very much. You completely mimic what you have. This is a Maltzev term for loops. So loops are permeance, con co sorry, congruence permutable, therefore also congruence modular variety, right? So here I have now explained why the previous general theory applied. Then uh, here is uh, the definition of supernal potence and the proof. So if you start with an algebra and uh, take a polynomial, then you say that the polynomial is absorbing at some tuple into E. If whenever you substitute for AI as a general argument an EI, then the outcome will be that E. Okay. So the moment one of the arguments is special, at least one, then uh, the outcome is also special. That's an absorbing polynomial. And we now say that an algebra is K supernal potent if every polynomial of arity bigger than K that is absorbing uh, uh, is constant. So the moment you are absorbing and of sufficient arity, you have to be constant. An algebra is supernilpotent if it's k supernilpotent for some k. So here the theorem I announced that if you have a congruence permutable variety, then an algebra, finite algebra, is supernilpotent if and only if it's a product of algebras of prime power order, the analog of the decomposition. Um, oh, nil potent, yes. I, I forgot the nil potent because in my world you get a nil potency for free, like you get in groups. I, I apologize. Okay, so now uh, super nil potents in groups. This is well known, and uh, very briefly, uh, it's enough to normalize the absorption. Uh, to go from an n-tuple of ones into one. Here is a typical absorbing term, right? The commutator, if you plug in one for x or y, it vanishes. And uh, and it's true that supernal potents, k supernal potents, implies k nil potents, but there are counter examples to the converse. There are two nil potent algebras that are not supernal potent at all. Uh, for groups, uh, a group is k nil potent if and only if it is k super nil potent, and uh, the proof uh, supposedly is folklore, uh, but I know that Erhard uh, wrote it down, and, uh, and David and I, because we had a hard time reading the proof, although in the end we end up mimicking it very much, gave a slightly conceptually simple proof of this fact. And it's based on the idea of iterated commutators, and you do the commutator calculus when you are proving uh, if, if you work with commutator calculus, you take a commutator and then try to get it out of the way, right? And as long as it's in the center, you can do that. But if it's not in the center, you have to get a more complex commutator and so forth. So the game is to keep track of all of these things carefully. And this slide says it can be done. It's about three pages and it's now published somewhere. I forgot to show. Uh, but uh, 
let me skip this because I'm running out of time. Finally, supernova potents in loops. So the same concept that we have seen. And fortunately, we also have some nice absorbing terms. You can define the commutator by uniquely solving this equation. You can define the associator by uniquely solving this equation. And you can see when I plug in one, let's say, into the associator, let's say for y, then I have xz is equal to xz times the associator. So the associator has to be one as a unique solution. So these are certainly absorbing terms. Uh, for k equal one to two, uh, a loop is super nil, k super nil potent if and only if it's a k nil potent group. Uh, so that's uh, not very interesting. Of course, the example I mentioned of two nil potent not implying super nil potent already happens in loops. And there's an example of order eight. So there's no way to so go, go the other way around. And uh, what we proved is find a nice finite basis for three super nil potent loops. So this might not look as nice to you, uh, but this is just a relatively short uh, list of uh, identities that have to be satisfied that are based on these two absorbing terms, the commutator or the associator. And uh, uh, those that you see at the beginning are very much what you would expect uh, from group theory, except the associators, of course, uh, are all trivial. But it's interesting at the bottom, I think, you can easily see if I substitute, let us say, uh, y is equal to 1 into the first uh, third from the bottom identity, then you get x u v is x u v times, times 1. Um, so these are so-called multilinear identities for the associator. And there are some very nice classes of loops, notably the so-called code loops uh, that were used in the construction of the monster group that uh, have this property. And that's really the most important property about them, that the associator is a multilinear mapping. Uh, so we have a basis for three supernova potents. Uh, we conjecture, of course, that K supernova potent loops are finitely based, but we didn't go through the technical problems associated with the proof to try to prove it. So if somebody is interested, it's an open problem. Are K supernova potent loops finitely based? And uh, I would be interested in the result. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, some references. All right, thank you.